Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of life in half a second by Matthew Michalwich. Uh, how to achieve success before it's too late. Everyone knows that life is short. It's one of the most overpreached truths on earth. It's something that early days popped up a lot on our podcast and for whatever reason, mate, it seems to have popped up a lot more this season more than any others. I feel like you've been bringing it back in. Mm. Life is short, but how short exactly? Well, he uses a bit of a metaphor to put it in perspective. So, compared to planet Earth, planet Earth is four and a half billion years old. Us Homo sapiens did not emerge until about 200,000 years ago. And the oldest known fossils of modern humans are only 160,000 years old only. Now, it's discovered in (laughs) Ethiopia. So, out of four and a half billion years that the planet has been roaming around in space, us humans, Homo sapiens, have been around for 0.0044% of the time, F all. Yeah, not a, it's kind of hard to visualize 0.0044%. So what he does is let's scale down that four and a, if that four and a half billion years was, was one year, so if our planet was one year old, in a relative sense, modern humans, we've only been roaming around for 23 minutes of that one year, which is not a hell of a lot at all. And measured on that same scale, if our planet was one year old, then your entire life amounts to half a second. Yeah, we're saying that. Before, F, that's really F4. Half a second just went before I finished that sentence. A lot of them are just still going right now as that sentence still going because that's all we've got is just half a second. We don't really appreciate this as kids, right? Like probably even now for a lot of us, time just seems it's just unlimited and it goes by so slowly. But as a kid, you're really impatient to just grow up and just sort of barrage your way through that time to become adults and try and enter the real world as quickly as you can. That's it. We imagined all the freedom we'd have or things we could do. When that adulthood finally rolled around, we'd realize that we'd have so much freedom and and possibility in our life. Then we just kind of discover now that we're spending a hell of a lot of our freedom paying bills, scraping through, often working in jobs we don't care about or don't even like. You know, life as we is not at all how we imagined it and disillusionment starts to set in. So we spent that half a second that we got really doing everything except what we really want. And as we grow older, time begins moving faster and faster and faster. And that long away today will never come when you're actually spending that half a second the way you want to. The tragedy of life isn't that we only have half a second to live. The tragedy is that we waste it. It's a good banger. It's a banger, man. It's a good banger. It is a tragedy. And it's the tragedy of human existence because it's a bit of a miracle, man. The planet's been spinning and forming and cooling for billions of years. The nature this whole time has been really busy making you from scraps of living matter, from bacteria, microbes, fermenting cells, fighting for the right to exist, squirming and striving, growing in complexity through millions of generations. Those organisms, man, they learned to breathe, they mutated, they spawned life on land and sea and air against the backdrop of centuries and millennia passing. Then finally, after all that, the first Homo sapien emerged. Somehow, I don't know how he knows this, but apparently they just popped out of the slime, you know, this mess of biology and creation and there was some animalistic urges and it stood up and walked and stared at the sky, marveling at the dark voids of cosmic dust above. Then the these first Homo sapiens embarked on the journey of all journeys. It was a 100,000 generation epic of survival, hunting, being hunted, overcoming frost, famine, struggling with tools made from wood and stone, discovering fire, migrating tens of thousands of miles to colonize the world, living uh, by the law of the fist or the law of the club, if, if you've got a club, coping with violence, rape, conquest, disease, without cures, starvation, enduring unthinkable pain and suffering, all so that this species could survive wild journey that this species has been on and the whole intent was to procreate over thousands and thousands and thousands of times in your generation and if you think about those thousands and thousands of generations each one of those little sperm you pop out when it pops out of the vessel (laughs) there's there's millions of them right there Mm. man and every day there's a different set of millions that could be popping out so it's Mm. an unlimited amount of pieces of sperm across thousands of generations literally if you you know if your parents uh, had an extra wine that night and chose date night for the day after the Friday and said this, you wouldn't be here. Mm, that's or it. pretty much if they went one extra hump on the bang, literally, man, it's probably, it'll be different momentum on the sperm that pops out. And out of the millions, it'll be a different momentum. one that comes. It's true. <laughs> that's science, is it? You get the point. <laughs> Gosh. 
gosh, that was a creating you actually, and only you. Disgusting. Metaphor. That's the whole journey where it's got to come. The great, beautiful specimen that's Adam Ashton right here, that's, and you for listening. That's it. Uh, really, the odds were ridiculous. It's more than what a trillion. You're saying a trillion. I think it's a hell of a lot more than a trillion. I think if it's you, a, effectively infinity. I know infinity. Exactly. Is, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're saying you know out of 300 million sperm to the power of thousands of generations, I'd say it's approaching infinity pretty quickly there. And you're really beating all the odds to get there and the sperm races and everything. Then you, there you are. After all those odds, man, trillions, trillions to one. That's it's impossible. It. And now, after overcoming those ridiculous, ridiculous infinity-sized odds, we're just sitting back, comfortably listening to a podcast, reading a book, safe, warm, fed, the beneficiary of millions of years of unimaginable suffering and billions of years of good luck, there you are. We've got half a second to live to enjoy the result of all this, just the marvel of existing, the miracle of being. What do we do with it? Everything except for what we want to do. It sounds ridiculous in that perspective, mm. right? Mm. All of this stuff has happened for you and we just waste it. We waste it on doing things that, that aren't what we want to be doing with this precious time we've got on earth. Now, he says, what would happen if we measured our, our days and our age in days left rather than years lived? Yeah, it's a different perspective, isn't it? We used to have that app. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> it's that app there's an app saying years there's more, left. There's more There's more apps you could find out there, but I'm sure that we wouldn't be anywhere near as relaxed and laid back as, as we were. If, if we weren't just saying, oh, we're, I'm 29 and a half, if we're saying, oh, shit, I've only got 18,133 days left to live, it's a very different perspective. Yeah, well, the point is when you do it like that, you realize there's a countdown, right? And there's a countdown on the authors, Matthew Mock, which is life. And guess what? There's a countdown on our life as well. So this, this book and this episode, it's all about the five doors to success. And the first door is clarity. And uh, big old Benjamin Mays, someone I'm not familiar with, could be his mate from the pub, I'm guessing. Hmm. But the quote is that it's not a disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace to have no stars to reach for. Bit of a banger also, you hmm. could say that one, Ashto. Because the shortness of life, as we've mentioned, it's pretty scary. But the shortness can also be motivating because we can do something with it. We can make the most of it. And the only way to make the most of that half a second that we've been gifted is by being clear on what the hell you want from it. Yeah. So this first door to success is the door of clarity. Successful people get what they want because they know what they want. You know, to achieve success, you need to know what success looks like. You need to define it. So success equals goal attainment and it's defined by what you aim for. If you think big, if you aim high and set large goals, your success will probably be large. If you think small, aim low and set small goals, then your sex... Whoa, it's not success. Your success, Astro, it's going to be small. But in either case, it's still success. But people fail in life not because they aim too high or too low. It's because they don't aim at all. There isn't a motivational speaker on the planet who doesn't advocate goal setting. We were just talking about a few of the uh, motivational speaker seminars we've been to in the past and can confirm that they do all talk about goal setting. Now, goals are powerful because they do allow your mind to focus is uh, something that pops up all the time at these seminars is the reticular activation system, which is a fancy name for the mind's ability to filter out all the irrelevant information and concentrate on the essential. Yeah, as soon as you, in modern society, I'm obsessed with <laughs> Teslas because I don't know why, but driving <laughs> in the why. car, I can see it a, I can see them pop up a million miles away, but any mm. other car, I can't see. But every single Tesla that goes past, they didn't even train Corey up. He goes, Tesla! <laughs> I had a mate driving in the back of my car with me and he just started laughing his head off. Is this, is this a typical trip for Adam and Corey? But it's because of the reticular activation system with all in on Tesla basically with stocks sort of financially invested and that's why the reticular activation system is set to it. The same thing happens with your goals. So you can make a precise goal and the point is that once you've kind of got that goal, once you've told yourself and once you've sort of explained to yourself what this goal is going to be, you're going to start seeing the metaphorical Teslas all around you, mm. those different paths to the success that you're trying to achieve. Well, if your goal is to run a business or something, you're probably going through the and be very successful in business. You go to the bookstore, your brain is probably going to go to um, just pop up and only see the stores that are, uh, are throwing out those words because there's pretty much infinite information that is getting pumped through the brain and it filters it out. If you're someone who's going and you want to find a partner and a relationship, you might uh, your brain might see you know stories and uh, fiction related books based on those sort of stories or nonfiction on that. So really, it is the way the brain filters it out. And when you set goals, you're really putting this 
uh, filtration system into action. There's one story that pops up a fair bit. It must be real. It, either that or it was a really good story that keeps getting repeated over and over. Jim Carrey, I think he used to clean toilets. I think that was his job. Um, and he said that he was a struggling actor trying to make ends meet. And what he did in 1987 was he wrote a check to himself and it said $10 million was the amount and the explanation was for acting services rendered and it had a future date on it, 28th of November, 1995. So we're talking eight years into the future here. He carried this check around in his wallet for eight years, you know, keeping that goal firmly in sight. He had his reticular activating system on the lookout for 10 million bucks. Apparently in 1994, he got paid exactly 10 million bucks to star in Dumb and Dumber and he was able to cash that check that he'd written eight years earlier. Pretty wild shit. Pretty spooky stuff. And really the point is we can design and we can bring things like that into our life. If you think about modern society, we design complex SATA sites, which are pretty wild, advanced medical devices or atomic bombs. Um, We can also do it in our own lives. Why can't we do the same designing our careers, our hobbies, the amount of free time we have or design what our ideal life looks like and then go out and make it happen? He says you can be 100 to 1. There was a study done. 100 people, for every 100 people on average, 80 of those don't have goals. 16 of them have them, but don't write them down. Three of them have them, they write them down, but they don't review it. And only one out of 100 writes them down and reviews them regularly. And of course, they're the ones who are going to achieve success. So if you want to unlock this door to clarity, if if you want to unlock this door to success, the door of clarity, then it's all about having those precise goals that you write down and regularly review. He throws a bit of a challenge here because if he says if you can't commit to a single goal on paper, and this is one of the it is the biggest indicator of success, is writing goals and reviewing them. It takes no time. Um, you can stop listening to his podcasts, or if you're reading the book, stop reading the book, and just give it to someone else because you just can't do this one thing. You're not going to succeed, and it's not because you're not capable. It's because you're choosing not to succeed by just mm. taking on this one piece of advice and taking it on. There you go. <laughs> The second door to success is desire. It's all about how much you want it. Do you ever wonder, you know, why do you do some things and not others? Some things you're willing to work hard for, some things you're willing to sacrifice for, but not others. You know, why do you exercise and eat healthy or why do you not exercise and not eat healthy? He says, it's all about desire. So it's the reason we do everything that we do and desire is the second door of success. So no matter what we do in life or the things that we bring into our life, Everything just stems from desire, simple as that. Like, for example, if you're trying to lose weight, uh, it comes up a lot in books because it's just a simple goal that we're all, you know, connected to, including myself. And some days, you know, if I'm in periods of where Chalky is looking pretty good <laughs> on a weeknight, I desire the Chalky a fair bit and that sometimes outweighs my desire to lose weight. And then that's probably why I'm on a pendulum because sometimes I get bigger than I like and then the desire of losing weight is higher than chalky. Then I'll lose a fair bit of weight and then you, the chalky is more important than the desire of losing weight. And that's the pendulum. He says that it's, it is quite easy and that all you need to do if you want to lose weight is to eat less and exercise more and anyone can do it. But it's just it all comes down to that desire. It is going to be uncomfortable. It is going to be hard to resist those urges. He says, why do some people do it and others fail? It all comes down to desire. Just some people want it more. Some people are willing to go through the the you know the uncomfort of having a, an empty belly or you know grinding away on the treadmill uh, and others cave to the desire of smashing a chalky bar so if you ever wondered what the odds of success of you achieving the goals that you've already set out on by this stage the likelihood of it is quite simply and it's very easy to measure and it's the desire you've got for those goals and that is basically the probability of success the more you want it the more desire the more hunger you have towards that goal the more likely you're going to achieve it because desire is going to force you to think about your goals. Sometimes 24-7, you can't get it out of your mind and it's going to be harder to think about everything else. And when it comes to thinking about the, the goals that we want, the best way is to have these all pointing in the same direction. You know, Having our written down goals that we're viewing lined up with our desire, lined up with what he calls the dream box. So he says that the most powerful way of picking goals that you're aligned to, that you can have that strong desire towards, uh, is to have things that are coming from this dream box. So a phenomenal, I think, caption of this is The Alchemist, which is really a story about uh, Santiago going uh, on the direction of his dream box and listening to his heart and the idea that Paolo, the author, is, you know, we've all got that same thing where we can listen to our heart. And 
Matthew says it. Matthew or Michael, which they're both have two first <laughs> names. Sometimes just guessing. <laughs> yeah, but basically, these these dream box items we've got, or the personal legends, listen to the alchemist. It comes from childhood when we're really free of boundaries, and this is where our brains that just don't have those uh, boxes thrust upon us. So you might have a dream of an astronaut, or becoming a race car driver, or a movie star. Um, all these things are within reach because you haven't told yourself otherwise yet. That's right. We put those dreams in the dream box. Nothing is too large. Anything can fit in there. You probably hit you know early teenage years and you start to look at the world a little bit differently. Maybe all of a sudden you don't want to be you know one of those six people that get shot off to Mars never to come back and you change your dreams a little bit. Uh, but they're still you know relatively boundless. You can kind of put whatever you want in there. They might just become a little bit more realistic, but the future is still very bright. We're extremely excited about what lies ahead of us. Then, of course, the seasons roll forward and we're flung out and of school of life and we go through it at bottleneck speed and all of a sudden our dream box, yeah, pretty easy to look at. But over time, as time goes past, we sort of get away the glitter from our eyes and the things and the responsibilities in our life multiply kids, the responsibilities with a mortgage, we're worried. And with every single responsibility gets thrown upon us, that little dream box that we had, it's a bit harder to just take a little peek inside. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, one day you might, after a couple of years, open up that dream box that last time and you, you're just shocked by what all the things that you used to want. All of a sudden, there's this massive gulf, a seemingly insurmountable gap between where you wanted to be and where you are now and you think, I think that, that might be it. I'm going to pop this dream box. I'm going to shut the lid. I'm going to tuck it away in the back corner of the bed, never to be opened ever again. And you just, as life goes on, you just forget that you ever had those dreams in the first place. That's um, literally how the alchemist describes it. Actually, I find quite interesting because when he was feeding to the alchemist in the desert, he was saying, if you follow the pyramids now, you know, you'll go there and get it or you can be comfortable now. But what's going to happen is that your heart, after two or three years, it's going to stop speaking mm. to you. And then, you know, you'll be good for two or three years. But over time, your heart is going to stop speaking to you entirely because you've stopped um, listening to it. So, I think a very similar metaphor here in the dream box, if you don't pay attention to it whatsoever, sooner or later, you might lose it forever. That's right. All of a sudden now, the things that we desire are much more sort of incremental changes. It might be getting that new car or getting a promotion or it might be the annual overseas vacation. Uh, dream box all of a sudden is just these little things and we completely ignore the fact that we ever had those big dreams in the first place. There's a quote here, do or do not do. There is no try by Brent German. Oh, wait, no, Yoda. Yoda, Yoda. that's right. Oh, gosh. That one popped up in the first iteration of, uh, you know, this is the third time we've done this episode. No? Yeah. Bullshit. Really? We did, it, we did it once, like episode five or six or something, and then we redid it about six months later before we interviewed the author. And ah, so, this is, is the third, right? this is the first third timer. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't even realize. <laughs> there you go. It's the, the second one was only six months after the first one. And that was what, Still five stunk. and a half years ago. Yeah. And we mentioned Brent German in it, and we have, again... Uh, but <laughs> how do we come back from this? What you believe, Asher. The third door is all about belief. That's what we're going to do. Nice. Good save. There's a well-documented placebo effect. And uh, it's pretty wild that the most consistent performer in clinical trials in pretty much every condition is sugar pills. Not the actual medicine that has been designed to fix these problems, but actually the sugar pills that we think are the real medicine. It's pretty insane. It's actually entirely insane when you look at it. Mm. Because, you know, depression, disability, asthma, other medical conditions, throw them a sugar pill, we get the job done. Yeah. The studies are wild behind it. And you know, Dan Ariely said as well, the more uh, expensive the placebo is, the better it works as well. So, the more money you pay for it, the the better it goes. I like it. Even in uh, something as uh, seemingly, you like you wouldn't believe it, that surgeries, there was a study of 180 patients that required knee surgery. And you think there's, you know, knee surgery is knee surgery. You can't fake that with a sugar pill. What they did was uh, for half of them, they did the operation as they were supposed to. For half of them, it was a sham surgery. They kind of put them under uh, with the anesthetic. They sort of opened up the knee. They kind of fiddled around a bit, but then closed it all up without actually doing what they were supposed to do. And you think, well, obviously, the people who didn't get the knee surgery, they're not going to heal at all. But it turns out 
that these people, after a little bit of rehab from not having actually had the surgery, they're in their wheelchair at first, but then they're popping up, they're walking, they're playing basketball with their kids, they're doing, they're doing slam dunks in the backyard, even though they didn't have the surgery to correct their incorrectable knee condition. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. Bizarre. Improved just as much as they did. Then you got the uh, negative of it. So there's a nocebo. So if someone has a harmless substance and you're told it's a harmless substance, like, you know, you get given another pill, but it's a sugar pill and they're still having this reaction because they thought it was something they were uh, allergic to. And all of a sudden, they've told it's like, you know, poison ivy or whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden, their whole arm's getting a rash and you're like, yeah. man, you just had a dose of sugar. Yeah, it's pretty wild, isn't it? Both the placebo and the nocebo, that something uh, happens just because we believe that that's what's meant to happen. So belief is our third door to success. This story gets proved a lot of the time because it's a wonderful story and it's of Rochester, Rochester Bannister, <laughs> Roger Bannister, who's a pretty good runner um, and he wanted a new goal. He wanted to be the first man alive to run the mile under four minutes and he publicly announced this goal. So his desire to succeed was absolutely high and he trained and trained and trained and trained and visualized his, his way into trying to get this under four minutes. And then after he came fourth in the Olympics, 1952, after all this ridiculous training on the 6th of May, 1954, he did a mile race and he popped in with an official time of 3 minutes, 59.3 seconds. So he'd just been the first person to crack under the four minute mark. Insane. So there's been a lot of races being run up until this point, many, many decades. No one's been able to crack it. But the most interesting part, as soon as he cracked it, six weeks later, another one broke the barrier. Mm. And the years that followed, countless others did the same. And it is, like, if you think about any world record around the world, it's pretty weird that no one's been able to break it up in that point, but almost every few years, someone breaks up a, a new world record. And that's because the only thing that is changing each time is belief because other runners or whoever's racing break the same barrier because they, now they know it's possible and it's easy to believe. Yeah, I just checked. The current world record is 3 minutes 43. So that's a hell, over a mile, that's a hell of a lot quicker. That's like an extra second per 100 meters, which is a uh, massive improvement. And as you say, it's just because previously everyone was like, no, nah, this is impossible. We can't do it. As soon as they saw the first person do it, they thought, oh, actually, maybe it is possible. And then gradually, 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 everybody seems to be able to do it. Yeah. So it's like a, I really like these doors. It's a pretty obvious one, but it's something that's, I mean, harder to just install into your life, just the <laughs> belief. Because obviously, if you don't believe it can be done, then you're not going to be taking mm. the actions that are required to get there. Now, the fourth door to success is knowledge. <laughs> I'll throw back to the first season there. <laughs> you love saying it like that. Ty Lopez. Oh, yeah. It's Lopez, <laughs> that was a, right. That yeah. was a, what's more important than these Lamborghinis? Knowledge. Knowledge. Well, Ty, he's, he's got the fourth door of success <laughs> he's there. Nailed it. He skipped a couple all the way up to door four. Because there's an undercurrent working against Ty, and Ty's figured it out. So is of Matthew, and so is Michael. <laughs> and, that's, and that's this undercurrent that's against us, and that is ignorance. Because you're never going to achieve your goals. Whatever your goals are, if you're ignorant mm. and you don't have the knowledge or, <laughs> on how to actually go after it, what hope you got? Ziz. <laughs> See, that's that's Ziz, it. Actually. Ziz was that the Melbourne bodybuilder who, yeah, who uh, I reckon wrote, he figured out this door as well. Wrote, he wrote it up big time, and he is no longer. Uh, if you define financial success, for example, as you know, you want a million dollars. That's just the you know you've gone through clarity, uh, you've set your goal, you might have a bit of belief that you can do it, but now it's okay. Now we're up to the knowledge part, and there's many different paths you can take to get there. One path to a million bucks is if you just put aside $287 per month, invested at the average you know, 8% annual returns, in about 40 years, you're going to have a million bucks. That's what your investment will add up to. You might think, oh, 40 years is a bit too long to wait for my million. I might want to get there a bit quicker. Maybe I can get 9 or 10 or 11% if I'd be a little bit uh, smarter or riskier with my investments. That's going to be a bit quicker. Maybe even quicker could be starting your own business or buying a franchise. Or if you want to get there really, really quickly, you know, maybe stocks, crypto, you know, or we'll just go hardcore gambling, try to double up, then double up, then double up, then double up, and you might eventually get to a million bucks. But of course, that's going to be a, a riskier path. Yeah, the path is getting shorter and narrower, but at the same time, your level of risk is increasing. But really, it's what path you take there is relevant. But really, it's only with knowledge you can understand what each path looks like and really weigh up and know the characteristics of, you know, that one's narrow and tall, but fast or wide and flat but long. You might even see a little side road, like you're playing that... um 
you know, Crash Bandicoot and you see that you go past the cave <laughs> on the right and you, you skip everyone on the race to the finish line and you're beating everyone. But it's only through knowledge that you can have those, those uh, situations or any goal, really. Yeah, that's right. The knowledge to get there is the important step to know, okay, I can take A, B, C, Q or Z. You need to know all those paths, the risks, the paths associated, uh, and then oh, that's a, that's. I don't know what I'm saying. I just fell off a cliff there. Yeah, you, uh, I, I tried to do that sneaky jump on Mario Kart, and I just missed the edge, and now I've got to get picked up by the. What I say? That's what I was thinking. Mario on. Kart, not um, not Bandicoot. Yeah. <laughs> I think Bandicoot's totally different. Yeah, it is, but I let I let that one slide. But if you think about if knowledge is is so important, then what makes your greatest asset that you've got, and. It's not your business, not your house, not your job retirement savings. It's not what you've invested into that goal of a million bucks. It's actually you as mm. who you are. You're the greatest asset. That's it. You've created all those other things that you listed. Uh, there would be no stocks, bonds, houses, businesses, retirement savings, jobs without you. And so as uh, big old Warren Buffett, he was a pretty good investor in his heyday. He, but he says the best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. A lot of the time, we don't think twice about buying a TV or a phone or a gadget or anything, and we're just going to throw it in the bin a couple of years later. But when we go to investing in ourselves, um, we sort of pause and cradle our wallet and become tight asses at this stage. <laughs> Even though like an investment in you now, whatever age it is, it's probably it's going to still be there mm-hmm. and whatever you learn from that, it's going to compound over time. I think pretty much every seminar hitter loves this point because basically it's a fantastic saying, sales pitch, isn't it? Following that is <laughs> uh, a pitch for ten grand for their course, and you're going to invest in yourself. In yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is expensive to invest in yourself, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than ignorance because ignorance means you're going to stuff up, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to do things wrong. When you're on your, uh, you know, you finally built up that retirement nest egg, you're about to hit your million bucks and then you realize, oh, shit, I was in a Ponzi scheme the whole time. It's now zero. That ignorance is going to be much more expensive than an investment in yourself and an investment in knowledge. The fifth and final door is action. So we're going through a hallway here and it's getting the fifth door here. You're getting through that. And success. It's a big. It's a big. It's a big party now. Yeah. It's a big garden. <laughs> lots of things going on here, but it's it's great because reading stuff and all these doors up to this point, it's just not going to solve the problem entirely. That's it. Reading a fitness book doesn't make you fit. Reading a business book doesn't give you a big business. You know, the only way to do it is to actually take some action. Yes. So a- action is the genesis of, of success. Um, and the start, the beginning, without action, there is no motion. Everything is frozen and sterile and dead. So action equals results. There's an equation. Yeah, action equals There's results. There's not even plus or minus. There's something or, in between. Sure. There's maybe few, action plus time log. or something. <laughs> or maybe it's just a direct one-for-one one correlation. Just do shit. <laughs> We've got through our four doors. We've stepped through the door of clarity, the door of desire, the door of belief, the door of knowledge. But as you say, we're standing at this final door. Unless we take some action, we're not going to step through that final door towards success. Of course, fear is something to working against us when it comes to action. If you've got those big visions and big goals and belief in it and everything like that, there's fear going to be trying to pull you down and it's going to prevent you from living a full life. And it's probably the only reason that people don't take action and why they don't pursue their dreams and start a business, follow their hearts change jobs, change countries, marriage, get divorced, go back to school, yada, yada, yada. It's because of that. Fear, man. Fear. This is like a a tranquilizer. It's a sedative. It's, you know, but the fear paralyzes us into, I think I did too many S's there, into doing nothing, into living in a bit of suspension. Uh, There's going to be all these things that the fear is just going to stand in the way of achieving anything. But here's the kicker. It's actually impossible to achieve success without moving out of your comfort zone. And for that reason, it's impossible to achieve your success without fear. So here's another equation. <laughs> fear equals progress, <laughs> which is true, which is true because if you're not out of your if you're in your comfort zone, you're not fearing anything and you're not progressing. Fear equals progress. So if you're feeling fear, it's probably a proxy measure, a metric yeah. for actual progress. That's yeah. that's a good one. So <laughs> so action equals results, fear equals progress. Fear it is inevitable on a path to success. You've got to control your fear or else your fear will control you. So the last key to unlock the door of uh, action towards success is to conquer your fear. Mm-hmm.